Hey, this is episode number 57 of Gen X Amplified, and today we are going to talk a little basketball and life lessons on being your true and authentic self, because I will be having a conversation with Melissa McGee Proctor, who is the executive vice president and chief marketing officer of the Atlanta Hawks and State Farm Arena. So are you ready? Let's do it. So just the whole idea of intention and what you put into the world and how that manifests itself, whether in a way that you intended or not, is uh, completely uh, an example of my life. Welcome, welcome to Gen X Amplified, where we bring you inspirational and entertaining conversations with successful Gen X leaders and entrepreneurs. This is the show created just for you. The powerful generation between the boom and millennials to help you amplify your story maximize your impact and become gen exceptional in business and in life now now here's your host adrian porter Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Gen X Amplified. This is the podcast dedicated to showcasing and giving a voice to that very powerful and exceptional generation between those brilliant boomers and magnificent millennials. And as always, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I truly, truly appreciate it. Well, today is a very special, special episode as I get a chance to chat with someone that I actually worked with at the same organization organization years and years ago, not dating myself. (laughs) So today's guest is a marketing and brand expert that started her career working in media, specifically with Turner Broadcasting, including networks such as TNT, TBS, Turner Classic Movies, and also Cartoon Network, which is where she and I actually worked closely together. Now, after her stint at Turner, she then pivoted to become an executive leader in sports particularly in the NBA where she is where she currently serves as the executive vice president and chief marketing officer of both the Atlanta Hawks and the State Farm Arena which is the team's home facility and she is here on Gen X Amplified to discuss this journey and more so without further ado please welcome my Gen exceptional guest the leading marketing maven hawk herself the wonderful <laughs> melissa <laughs> mcgee proctor melissa how's it going wow man it is amazing i don't think i've ever had such a warm reception in my entire life i uh, <laughs> feel like i need to go run on a court right now or something that's, uh, that's next level Thank you. Thank uh, you so much. And I am honored to be here and be on this podcast. Well, it is my pleasure. It's an honor. And it's been a long time since we had a chat. So this is going to be fun. Uh, but but seriously, you know, before we get into the story, I, I just want to, um, in full, full disclosure for my audience, I thought I would briefly just acknowledge something that I thought would be very fitting, considering the day and the time of this recording and also the work that you do, Melissa. So as of this recording, as of last night, and well, actually, quickly, uh, congratulations on the big win last night <laughs> for the Hawks. Thank uh, you. Thank but, you. But speaking of last night and yesterday, at the time of this recording, it's been about 24 hours since I found out the news that um, my literally and honestly, the people that know me know my favorite basketball player, NBA player of all time is Kobe Bean Bryant. And tragically, Kobe Bryant passed. Um, yesterday at the time of this recording, tragically, unexpectedly, along with his beautiful daughter, Gigi. And just quickly for me, and you know, this show is all about uplifting and empowering people that are kind of in our generation, 40s, early 50s, and and I believe he was 41, and definitely a Gen X leader, a a quintessential Gen Xer, one who has pivoted and reinvented himself, which is a lot what we talk about, especially in this phase of our lives, successfully with Granity Mm -hmm. Studios. And he meant a lot to me. Melissa, before we get into your journey, because of the great work you do in the NBA, specifically with the Hawks and you having a very storied career in the NBA, which we're going to talk about. Can you just share a little bit about what Kobe being Brian, number eight, number 24, meant to you personally and professionally, if you don't mind? I mean, yesterday, I think it it definitely was a blow to everyone. And personally, my very first a year working in the NBA. I was in high school and, and was a ball girl mopping up sweat on the court for the Miami Heat. And that was actually Kobe's rookie season. And I had a picture 
of me taking you know, a picture with him. And I remember at the time it was all the rage because he had just gone to prom with Brandy. And so he was like, wow. what? Wow. And, and, and I found that picture yesterday and it literally brought tears to my eyes because throughout my career, I mean, I've, you know, been in the same room or shook his hand. Obviously I didn't know him well, but you know, through all that he's done and accomplished and his mama mentality. And I mean, even during his, final season and coming here to the Hawks, you know, it was working with the team from a marketing standpoint and mm -hmm. working with uh, the Atlanta zoo to name their black mama snake, Kobe. Oh, in that's his honor. Right. That's uh, right. And then announcing that we announced it at the game and gave him a framed picture of the snake. Like, but you know, all, all those things being said, I mean, there were so many just stories about how awesome he was as a person and as a mentor and all the amazing things he brought to the game and elevated, not just himself, but everyone around him. Um, and a couple of years ago, I was at an NBA league meeting and he spoke um, with uh, Phil Knight from Nike. And it was like phenomenal just, you know, in conversation. And you really get a chance to just kind of hear him talk. And it was mm -hmm. a lot around the pivot, and, you know, kind of the what's next. But, you know, it was a super sad day. And even internally, you know, our team, you know, Trey, uh, Trey Young, um, he was a mentor to Trey as well. And so he wore the jersey with number eight on it for the first two possessions of our game, you know, in his honor. And, you know, just the league has you know, done a, a remarkable job just within this short time because you no one's ever prepared for anything like this right. or, you know, knows exactly how to, to handle it. I'm, you know, thinking I'm going to a game and the phone calls are flooding in and text messages. And so, I mean, I think he, it just, it's a testament to how much he meant, not just to the game, but to our generation. Yes. This is a figure of someone who's done amazing things and that, you know, really lived out that mantra that anything is possible. Yes, that's right. And I well, first, I appreciate that insight, Melissa. I know that uh, and we'll get into a little bit of your your story, especially starting with the big, big uh, ball girl <laughs> um, stint. And that part of the piece I did not realize or I've never really put the pieces together as far as the year you started was his rookie year. And that is that is amazing. And I know that last night as well, I watched uh, some of the highlights and the Trey Young, um, it, it, you know, when people wonder if things are aligned and things happen, they just happen. And you start to peel back some of the stats from last night and all the tributes and the players in the NBA. And then Trey specifically, you know, the number eight and then the shot attempts that he took, um, I believe, 24. It's crazy. And then the last the, the I think the half court shot that Trey Young took and he makes yeah, those, he, he makes did. those shots all the time. But the odds of it happened. It, so, you know, it, it, it was a very emotional day and I truly appreciate what you said is about him being really a, just this pillar for our generation. And it wasn't just about basketball and just the intelligence, just the, the, the strategic thinking, the commitment to discipline um, and the legacy that he leads is truly going to be felt um, throughout. So I appreciate those, those insights, Melissa. But, but speaking of legacy, um, and speaking of uh, double MP, <laughs> legacy Melissa McGee Proctor, <laughs> um, I would love for you to talk briefly just about your journey. And you mentioned you were a ball girl um, <laughs> with the Miami Heat. Can you just talk about how you got that role and then what led you to go from that to becoming an executive in marketing, and then we'll kind of cap off and just talking about what you do now with the Atlanta Hawks in the in the arena. Sure, um, you know it's such an unconventional story, and you know, ironically, this uh, Saturday Oprah was in town for her 2020 Vision event, and I remember uh, growing up as a kid, like my goal in life was to meet Oprah. Like all I ever wanted to do, like, <laughs> that was it. And, and this Saturday, I actually got an opportunity to meet her, didn't know that I would. And so just the whole idea of intention and what you put into the world and how that manifests itself, whether in a way that you intended or not, right. <laughs> is uh, completely uh, an example of my life. And so I'm from Miami originally, and uh, my mom was from Belize, my father's from Jamaica. And growing up um, in Miami, like I'm an only child. So same here, I same here. Loved, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I loved art. So I okay. would paint and draw all day. I ended up going into a magnet schools, which are kind of like charter schools here in Atlanta focused on art. And so with those magnet programs, they really weren't any you know, athletics. You would have your academic courses and then whatever your field was. And for me, that was art. So okay. middle school, I pursued that. 
high school, I went to this uh, design and architecture senior high school in Miami. Like to you know, really kind of major in graphic design in high school. Mm-hmm. And I had a cousin who loved basketball. And she'd be like, oh, let's watch this game. And I knew nothing of the game, so she kind of explained it to me. And through watching Heat games with her, I fell in love with basketball. And so when I was 15, uh, I remember asking my mom to get a job because all of my friends had jobs. And they were working at the mall or the movie theater. And I just thought it was cool. Mm-hmm. And she said, okay, now, you know, sure, you can get a job as long as it's in whatever you want to do for the rest of your life. Mm. And I had, a, I was like, say what? <laughs> <He's> 15, <laughs> you have no idea what that is. But right. because of my love for basketball, and I was like, I don't want to be an artist because I'm already kind of doing that at school. I told her, um, no clue how this entered my 15 year old mind, but I was like, I want to be the first female coach in the NBA because I would watch these games and only see men on the sidelines and never women. Mm. And so my mom being the awesome person she was, she was like, okay, cool. Go get a job in the NBA. Wow. And that was it. You know, the gauntlet was laid and there wasn't really a conversation. It's like, well, how do you do that? And, you know, because there was not another side of the conversation around like feasibility, it just made it where, you know, the world was mine and I could, just, it was mine for the taking. So mm. I, you know, let my finger do the walking. <laughs> now that yellow page is no longer <laughs> exists. And I started making phone calls. I called the 1-800 number switchboard for the heat, ended up getting connected to someone in community relations. And, um, you know, they were like, Hey, unfortunately call me back eventually and said, you know, we don't have any jobs, you know, for kids. You may want to try the equipment manager. I didn't know what an equipment manager was because mm-hmm. I never really played, um, organized sports. And so, I ended up writing letters to a guy named Jay Sable, okay. who then was the equipment manager for the Heat. And I would draw all over the envelopes, all over the letters. I would draw pictures of Alonzo Mourning or of the Heat logo or whichever. Mm-hmm. Um, not even really knowing I was marketing myself and helping my letters stand out. Mm-hmm. And then I would also follow it up with a call. And one day, you know, I called the guy and he was like, hey, Melissa, you know, I received your letters. Thank you. And I got your messages. <laughs> and he was like, but if you call me one more time, like, I'm, I'm not going to hire you. you know. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, so sorry. And then I stopped for a while and I kept on calling. And then uh, eventually one day he called me and he said, hey, we'd love for you to come into a preseason game. Um, he really tried to discourage me. And he was like, yeah, you, you know, um, I'm not sure what you know about basketball or equipment managing, but for this role, he's like, I have some ball boys. I don't have any girls, but a lot of what they do is, you know, uh, mopping up sweat, folding towels, handing out Gatorade, hanging up uniforms. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, you know, not a very sexy job. Oh, and by the way, it does not pay, <laughs> which I wasn't, <laughs> truly, wasn't really prepared for that part. Right. But I was like, it sounds great. Um, because I really didn't have a choice. Okay. And so I ended up going, he asked me to come in for a preseason game. And at that time I had never set foot in the arena before, never been to a concert or sporting event. I didn't know anybody, no hookups, no, I had, I had no context of what I was walking into. Okay. In that first game, they gave me, you know, the full outfit. I was like, cool enough just for the outfit and some shoes and some heat gear. And he said, you know, go rebound. I had no clue how to rebound. I didn't know anything. Mm. Um, but I tried and I think at the end of that first game I was diving for loose balls and you know, they taught me how to make a mop and learn how to mop up sweat and he, he, he really acknowledged me he said you know you have a lot of heart and I definitely saw you gave it your all out there we'd like for you to come back for another game and I think he gave me $20 which was like kind of the tip for the night everybody okay. did well we got tips and that was the beginning of my career in the NBA and um, the team owner's uh, son was also a ball boy and so you know, he and I struck up a friendship and then his sister would go to every game and, you know, would always just sit and watch. And once I started being a ball girl, she was like, Hey, I can do that too. So she and I were the first ball girls on the court oh, wow. for the Miami Heat and, um, yeah, it became a family. So the players, Alonzo Mourning and Tim Hardaway, I think Dan Marley, PJ Brown, there were a lot of awesome players at that time, Jamal Mashburn, Brent Berry were all playing for the Heat. And so they literally taught me everything. Dan Van Gundy was an assistant coach and he would run plays for the guys and I would, you know, sit there and set a pick and mm. help them do passes and players would teach me how to pass properly. And Pat Riley uh, was my idol at the time. And mm. so he would be, you know, writing plays up the timeouts and I would, and they would write it on like pieces of paper 
and crumble it up and throw it under the bench. And at the end of the night, I would pick up all the pieces of paper and make a little binder for myself <laughs> uh, to try to understand the plays. I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> but uh, it was the most amazing time. And that ultimately was the beginning of my career in basketball. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm just literally amazed at this story. I can actually put myself in the Heat Arena, seeing the sweat that you're mopping up. And I can actually oh see. Oh, my God. <laughs> I can see you running around. You said you were running for loose balls and and and, yep. and the artistry and, and you kind of channeling your, your artistic passion and making binders and writing, drawing on letters, you know, so, 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 so that was a lot there. And, and so I want to just, and we're going to get to how you go from that to a full 360 and in the middle or around the circle, if you will, taking a stand in marketing and media, but let's, let's go back to this. So a couple of great nuggets I think are very instrumental, especially to this audience. Number one, Number one, when you were around 15, you said, and everyone, I remember that day when I was 15, I was getting my first gig and my actual first job was McDonald's, believe it or not. I was in the, I was going into the 11th grade and I started off on biscuits and making salads and I lasted two weeks because it, that was just me. But anyway, you at that moment at 15, your first gig, you had this, wow, this tremendous coach, speaking of coaches and sports, in your life, in your mother, that saw she she already set the path for you for success and those words of yeah, well what absolutely. do you want to, what do you want to do for the rest of your life melissa i mean not okay let's just get a gig and not to belittle the other routes because many people go that route but it was something it's something about her that put something in you to think about something in the long term and i think and i would again i'm sure you would agree and you showed the story that moment those words really charted the path for you moving forward, right? Because you thought about it and you said, 100%. and then at 15, you did have a vision that transcended beyond high school. You said you wanted to be the first female coach in the NBA and there were not, there wasn't one. So already disruption was in your DNA <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and, and, and that and diligence was in your DNA. And that's amazing that that path started at 15 what so let me ask you this is she was she always like that with that type no, of advice no and it's so interesting because you know my mom she was a registered nurse my entire life she went to nursing school in england okay um like i mentioned she was from belize and so her path was very different growing up in belize going to nursing school in england where she had pictures of herself and she was the only black person out of hundreds of people a couple of women from China, but like she had her best friend in York and all these things. And so her world was so big to me okay. and broad, just based on the experiences she had. She had me at 42. Okay. I was her first and only child. And so like she lived her life before she had me. She has a brother that lived in Africa. She went and hung out with them for a while. Wow. Like she did a lot of cool things. And so I think by the time I came around, she was like, you know, you know, I, it was almost like she made me an old soul because of all of her experiences. Mm. The one thing she would always say is nothing beats a trial but a failure. So she was like, we would go to uh, any, pick a chicken spot, you know, KFC or churches or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she would just be like, Hey, can I get like one piece of chicken? That's when I try it. And they yes. would be like, Oh, your smile is so beautiful here, ma'am. Mm. You know, take whatever. Or we would go to the flea market and she would haggle for things and, you know, someone will call for five, fifty dollars and she get it for five. Wow. And was like, How did you do that? She was like, I asked. And a lot of times people would never even have the audacity to ask the question. Okay. And so that taught me a lot because I saw her do it and I'm like, Damn, Mark. <laughs> like, <laughs> how did you do that? Um, and it was cool. And so even in that instance, I think she felt the same way. She was like, Well, if you want to get a job, well then try. At wow. least the worst they're gonna say is no. And at least you tried. And her other thing was like, no matter what it is you do, always do your best. Okay. And if I was in school and I had a class that I was horrible and she, I got a C, she's like, well, did you give her your all? Mm -hmm. And if I did, she would be so ecstatic with that C. And mm -hmm. if I knew that I didn't, she was like, nah, try wow. again. That's not how we do things. And so all of those lessons, like she instilled in me and now I'm instilling in my daughter, but I feel like it was so critical because, you know, people talk a lot about a glass ceiling and it's like, I never felt like one existed mm. because I didn't allow myself to think that. Mm, that's so powerful. Yeah, you didn't see, you didn't sense it. And I, and I see and hear, uh, here especially, a why you didn't sense that because of those lessons 
that your mother instilled in you. And you mentioned, and I look and I kind of hear three pillars. I hear the first one is really just set the vision, like have that initial seed in that vision first. And then secondly, try, just try it out. And then third, like you said, do your best. Just mm-hmm. be the best at what you do. And what, what is your mother's name? Olivia. Olivia, Olivia. So kudos to Mal- Olivia. <laughs> um, that's just amazing because I just really think that even if you don't have that in your life, not everyone has maybe not have that type of guidance with them for various reasons. And just to hope the, hopefully these words will imp- inspire you no matter what age you are, is that just set the vision and believe it and look to disrupt and just try and do your best. And the worst thing that can happen can at least you tried and you, and you yeah, only fail and you learn something new and you learn something new. Exactly. So, wow. So you got your first taste of sweat NBA sweat uh, in as a, at a young age, <laughs> as a ball girl, that's amazing. And you're around some, definitely some amazing leaders. You mentioned Alonzo Mourning, Tim Hardaway, uh, PJ Brown, whom I actually met for the first time here um, in the Atlanta area at a Friday's my yeah. son and I. <laughs> yeah, he lives here. I'm yeah. He catch up every night one day. And I'm like, what up? Collier. He hates that. I'd be like, what up, Collier? Collier. Like, oh, come on, man. That's so great. So you went from there and obviously along the way, because I met you um, for the, I think it was maybe probably in 2009 or so. I started working for Cartoon Network in 2008 and left in 20, uh, 2011. And that's when you and I met. How did you get to Turner yeah. Broadcasting, which is now Warner Media, which is now very different. <laughs> a whole lot of different things. A whole lot of different things. It's a get very there? different world now. Yes. How did you get to um, uh, working well, there? Yeah. So when I was in high school, throughout my high school years, I continued working uh, with the Heat. And my senior year, I had no idea what I wanted to do um, with my life. And so my, I had a young lady who worked at the Heat who went to Wake Forest. And okay. she told me a little bit about it as a, as a school, Winston Salem, North Carolina. But the one thing she said was that they have a, a mantra, which is pro humanitate, which translates into for humanity. And everything they did was for people. And at the time, in addition to working at the, the heat and doing art, I was very much into volunteering. My mom was a nurse. So I was a candy striper. I was mentoring young kids in art. And I really vibed with that vision. It was also like I wasn't a straight A student, but I did well. Um, that it was looking at your overall sense as a person. So not just SAT scores and grades. It was like all that you bring to the table. Okay. And I liked that. And so I ended up applying to go to Wake Forest on an art scholarship and got in. Okay. And so I spent four years in Winston-Salem. They had a good basketball program. I was so interested in basketball. I was a equipment manager for the basketball team and football team my freshman year. Um, but every summer I would go back and help volunteer with the Heat. You know, whether it's putting together scouting reports around draft time, right. free agency. Uh, one of the summers they had launched uh, the now defunct uh, WNBA team for the Miami, the Miami Soul. Okay. So I got to be a big part of launching that, which was cool. And so my senior year of college, I was like, well, I got to get a job in the NBA. Cause that's what I said I was going to do. Mm-hmm. I kind of moved away from coaching because uh, I started to learn. I'm like, if you've never played the game, <laughs> kind of hard for you to coach it. I mean, some people can, but right, right. Um, I was more interested in understanding kind of the league from a business standpoint. So I applied for a management training program that the league had in Secaucus, New Jersey. And so I got a, a, a apply for it. I had letters of recommendation from Pat Riley, from Alonzo Morning, where mm. my mind, like, that was it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got this. Who's going? You can't deny this. <laughs> and I had uh, done all of this work. And um, I did my interviews. I did a couple of them. They went well. And then one day, they kind of called back uh, from the league and they said, you know, we love you. You come highly recommended. However, um, you know, we're a business and you're a little bit too creative a candidate for what we're looking for. Mm. And I was crushed. I was like, that was my job. Right. You know, that was my whole vision. And where I was headed, I was going to work in the league. And so um, at the time, I didn't know what I was going to do. I applied to stay in school because everyone does that. You don't know what you want to do. You go to grad school. And right. Just stay a little bit longer to figure it out. Yes. And I, I was the communications major at Wake. So I applied to stay there for grad school. And um, the head of the comms department, who I was pretty close with, did my interview for them, and they turned me down. And they were like, yeah, this is a crutch for you. We think that you're destined for bigger and better things. Okay. And that, you know, you only want to be here as a crutch, which was partially true. Um, and so they're like, we're not going to give you the opportunity. And it forced me to find something else. And the, a woman who was the head assistant in the communications department had a flyer 
from a program at Turner called T3. Mm-hmm. And it was an internship program called the Turner Trainee Team. And she's like, Melissa, I know you're really creative. And I saw this thing and it made me think of you. And I was like, what is it? And all it said was finish your talent in a project. I didn't know what Turner was. I said I'm from Miami and it was still Atlanta. Uh, but when I read up on what they wanted, it was sounded intriguing. You know, looking at all the networks, CNN, TNT, TBS at the time, okay. Cartoon Network. And so I ended up designing a magazine, the TV Guide, which seems so archaic in Gen X <laughs> years now. <laughs> like, oh, you have a magazine that tells you what's on TV every week. <laughs> <laughs> and so I uh, designed a T3 TV Guide, and it was all about myself and my brand. I had some of my artwork, writing samples in it, a resume, just like some fun ads that I created that put me in every network. So I was from Cleopatra in a Turner Classic movie ad. I was a black Powerpuff girl in a Cartoon Network ad. Mm. And I had so much fun making this magazine. I designed it with my graphic design skills that I had acquired. And I got it printed by the Wake Forest Library. They had a printing service in there. Mm-hmm. And um, I just love this little magazine and I sent it in and I ended up getting a call back from TNT marketing. Then they said, you sold yourself so well to us. We think that you would do an amazing job of selling our content to consumers. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really understand what that meant. I had never taken a marketing class in earnest. I didn't know what branding meant, mm-hmm. but I had branded myself through this marketing piece well enough for Turner to tell me that I could brand television <laughs> and market it. Right. So that's how I got my foot in the door. And I started uh, Turner as an 11 month paid intern, thankfully, okay. not partially paid, right. um, at, in TNT marketing. And because of the partial payments, I didn't make a ton of money at all. I called up my old boss in the heat and asked if he knew anyone at the Hawks. And he introduced me to the equipment manager. And my first year here in Atlanta, I was a ball girl on the court for the Hawks, mopping up sweat too. <laughs> Wow, wow, wow. So it's interesting. And you went all the way through. I know you started in the T3 program, which I definitely remember that. And I, I think they may still have that. I'm not sure. There's been so many changes <laughs> at Turner. Yeah, since I it's been a lot of changes. <laughs> a lot of changes. And then obviously, you started as a T3. But when 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 I uh, was working with you, you had ascended into some pretty significant leadership positions um, there with, uh, I think, what was it, Turner? And, uh, what was the Turner name? Media Group Turner for Media a while. Group. That's um, right. Yeah, the, the, my, my time at Turner was interesting because when I started as an intern, uh, I think maybe it's an 11 month internship and around eight months into it, yes. uh, TNT Marketing had offered me a job to stay on as a marketing coordinator. Okay. And I was maybe 22 at the time and I was like, everyone around me, they were older and settled, starting to get married and mm-hmm. it just freaked me out. And I was like, no, I'm not ready to settle or whatever that meant. Mm -hmm. And so I actually decided to go to grad school. And so I quit Turner all together and left to go to grad school in London. I had gotten accepted to a a program in London at the Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design. Wow. And it was a one year master's. And I really, I had done a semester abroad in undergrad and I loved Europe. And because my mom had gone to nursing school in England, I heard all these stories about London and I had family over there. So I left and moved to London for a year and it was the most amazing thing ever okay um ended up interning at turner's uk office while i was over there just through networking and meeting folks Mm -hmm. and um at the time my mom was disabled Uh, when i left to go to college she went on a disability and so i ended up having to come back to the states to help take care of her even though she was in florida obviously london was much further away than atlanta so right um after my master's program i came back to atlanta and turner you know offered me a position as an hd graphics producer Mm. I went to grad school focused on brand strategy and they're like, Hey, we got this art job because they knew that I was an art girl. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I came back and I learned a ton and I really helped our you know, creative team build an internal agency in partnership with the marketing department, which is great. Right. So I did that for about three years and finally got an opportunity to work in brand strategy. Um, when we had acquired court TV, right. so being able to work on the rebrand from court TV to true TV, right. which was awesome. And then a couple of years after doing that, about a year after doing that, uh, we had some internal uh, culture building work to do. So I was part of with an organizational psychologist mm-hmm. and did kind of a change management project, which is weird because it's very hr but I loved it mm-hmm. um, within the, all of the entertainment networks and internal media group, as you mentioned, was it, it was always Ted Turner had built this internal media planning buying team to help save money, which was smart. Right. 
And so new leadership on that group was looking to all the CMOs asking what they needed and they wanted consumer insights and Mm -hmm. trends and wanted to know what was happening outside of television. Mm -hmm. And so we created this insights and inspiration team, which is just a cool title period. Yes. So I was the director of insights and inspiration and got to really kind of push boundaries outside of television to understand what was happening in other places and look for things that connected us and could help elevate, you know, our work and our marketing product. Mm Mm-hmm. And then from there, I ended up going over to Cartoon Network and Adult Swim for a while in business strategy. I wanted to really raise my business acumen for working with the president of the network and our um, finance team and financial modeling to really understand like we were going to go over the top, which then was a whole new thing. Now everyone's going over the top, creating their own services for products like Adult Swim or looking at how the brand can grow over time. It's a long range modeling and planning. Right was able to do that with Cartoon Network and Adult Swim. And then finally, as a part of that role, they asked me to sit on a task force for a digital health and wellness startup that Turner was launching. And we needed to come up with a name for it and content for it. And so it ended up becoming a brand called Upwave, which was very cool at the time, looking at data and the quantified self and really serving up content to help that become meaningful. I remember that. Um, And yeah, they pumped a lot of money into it and, uh, you know, unfortunately for how business and how it works, the last business started is normally the first one cut. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the, pre, the Phil Ken, the older CEO of Turner, left. Uh, the new CEO that came in was the chief financial officer from Time Warner. Mm-hmm. And uh, no one knew then, but I'm sure they were at the beginning stages of preparing to be sold, obviously, as you know, the world has now shifted. So right. um, Upwave, the business I had started, we, you know, a great team of us. We had been working on it for about a couple of years. Uh, about six or seven months after we launched it, they cut the whole business unit. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the time, I was eight months pregnant mm. with my first child, or my only child, mm. and was out of work for the first time since I started working as an intern. And so it was an interesting position to be in. But um, truly, I believe everything happens for a reason because. I want to say about a month and a half after I got laid off, I had my daughter a couple a week after I got laid off or so. Um, I ended up going to the Phillips arena then as a fan for a draft party that the Hawks put on and ran into an old mentor from the Hawks. And he said, Hey, you know, I need help building a brand here. I know you love branding. And he remembered me mopping up sweat as a ball girl <laughs> for the Hawks when I was an intern oh, wow. and uh, said, okay, hey, come, come me build a brand. And I, you know, came in and sat in on a couple of meetings, started consulting, and then ultimately joined the Hawks as, as the vice president of brand strategy. And then later learned that that same executive, when he left Turner, you know, wasn't able to poach any talent. So had I not taken that up with job and gotten laid off, I mm-hmm. probably wouldn't be in the position that I'm in right now. That That is an amazing story, journey, uh, cu- curriculum for <laughs> how can you successfully navigate your own personal brand and relationships? And, and, and I'm going to break down the reason why, because you had so many nuggets there as well. You, What I kept hearing, Melissa, in this thread during your journey is you were doing things that you pa- you were just passionate about and you just did them well. And people remembered them. And these dots connected. And what I mean by that. You were talking about how you went well, you, first when you were a ball girl and you were trying to get an internship and you were drawing on the letters and people thought you was very creative. And I'm sure those things stood out, which allowed them to say, come in, we have an internship for you is non paid. You'll be mopping up sweat and doing grunt work. But they remembered you stood out. Then later, if you fast yeah. forward yeah. to the um the the T three position and some of the other things, somebody said, Melissa, you're really creative. And like so you said that they said they told you that you're really creative. You may be you may be you may want to do this. You may be good for this. And then you fast forward again after you left Turner and you were laid off. And many of us Gen Xers, we go through that. And yep. that, that feeling is for like, sure. oh, God, what am I going to do with a kid and family? That person at the Hawks said, hey, you know what? You're really creative. You may want to help us build a brand. And so what I mean, and re- I'm pausing there because it's, again, a testament to you doing your job well, but you just doing the work. And you obviously nurture some really great relationships because people 
always remember what you do. But if you have a good relationship with them, they will recommend you. They will champion for you. They will know. That's what a brand is. A brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room and it stays with you. Absolutely. And so that I just wanted to for just sure. triple down on that. And that led you to the Hawks and you started off helping them build a brand. And now you are over the brand <laughs> and, and as chief marketing <laughs> officer. And remember, listeners, remember, Melissa started off in this field, in this industry, mopping up sweat, okay? Mopping up sweat, taking the balled up game plans from from Riley and making a scrapbook or whatever she, she said. And now she's helping to shepherd the brand and telling the story of the Atlanta Hawks and also this new arena. What would you say, Melissa, as you as this mid-career professional, looking at your journey, what are some of the key lessons that you learned that you adhere to that you think people should really take away from when it comes to just succeeding and thriving and going through a period of transition, going through a period of reinvention? Yeah. yeah. No, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, for one, I mean, I, I have faith, you know, I'm a woman of faith and mm-hmm. I really, you know, believe in that. And I have, so I say this all the time and it's good and bad, but like, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. So the fact that I am in this role right now, I'm like, did you always want to be a CMO? And I was like, if you asked me seven years ago, if I would be a CMO, I'd be like, I don't know about that. <laughs> you know, I did not Absolutely not. But in like a, that's not my vision. And okay. so earlier in my career, I um, had a mentor that really stressed the importance of guiding principles. And so I, adopted that because I found that for me and everyone's style was different. It was helpful to not necessarily be focused on a title or, you know, like one destination. At at one point in my career, uh, when I went to grad school, I really wanted a job in branding. And so I was focused on like, I want a, I want a brand job, but that was it. And so after grad school, a couple of years later, I got a brand job and then I was like, so what now? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, that's it. Like you just don't stop working or this is your job forever. And so it just kind of helped me right. expand my horizons. And so for me now, it's more around like living life. Like life will always be more important than work to me. And I say that, I say it to my team all the time. And so in, in thinking of that, I'm like, what are those things that give me fulfillment? So one is being able to be both creative and strategic in anything that I do, because I need both of those things in order to make me feel like I'm contributing. Okay. You know, another one is if I can do something in my sleep, um, I don't need to be doing it. So as long as I'm adding new tools to my toolbox or if I was an agency, you know, building another tool for my capabilities presentation, then I feel like I'm growing and learning. Mm. Um, I figure when you stop, that means you're dead. Mm. Um, The other one is my mom was horrible with money. And so, you know, financial literacy is important to me and really, you know, being able to make enough money to pay my bills on time mm-hmm. <laughs> and invest a little bit and I get my lights cut off because I had experienced that and I knew that that's not what I wanted. Um, some sort of work-life harmony. Mm. You know, the word balance is overrated and, you know, sometimes it ends and flows, especially now I got a five-year-old. Mm-hmm. But really being able to live and work in a place where I'm not chained to a desk or if I needed to leave to go to a dance recital, I can do that. Um, it's really important. And then the final one is like just being able to be me. Like I am myself through and through. I got locks and a nose ring and I <laughs> am very happy, mm-hmm. you know, with myself and who I am. And I need to be able to go to work and just be that and mm-hmm. not necessarily feel like I have to assimilate or wear my hair a certain way or dress a certain way. Mm-hmm. I remember when I first started uh, and I was CM- like when I was first promoted to CMO, I'd come to work in Jordan's and a and sweatshirt and mm-hmm. people are like is that your CMO <laughs> and they're like <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it, and that's okay or uh, I tell the story about why I go park in the reserve parking space here at the arena and sometimes they'll stop me and say hey I'm sorry ma'am this space is reserved for executives and every time they do I love it <laughs> because all it means is that I'm breaking down a stereotype of what people assume an executive looks like mm. um, and I'm not trying to look different I'm truly just being me and so, you know, those are my guiding principles. And so I don't, I'm always open to wherever uh, God and universe will lead me as long as those things hold true. And they've, you know, evolved over time. But for me, for anyone, I'd say really establishing what's important to you. I have a lot of people that say, I want to be a CMO. And I'll say, well, why? You know, mm-hmm. and one of the reasons I remember talking with my current boss about, you know, my position, he was like, he said, I'm promoting you to CMO. And I asked him why, and he was just like, you know, 
you didn't because you don't you don't want it. <laughs> the reason why I'm here is because my goal was to make I call it making dope shit. I, I want to do good work, mm. and that should be what drives you. But a lot of people are driven by the title or the perceived power or the perceived money or whatever the case may be, and the intention behind that is very different mm. than the desire to really just make something amazing. Mm. And so I would, I, I really, uh, you know, I'm a firm believer of defining what those guiding principles or values are for yourself. And then, you know, not necessarily getting so caught up in the title because people get, you know, disappointed or let down if they don't reach that thing where as if they kind of broaden what that scope or filter is for them, you may find it in a lot of different ways that you didn't even know was possible. Wow. Wow. You, you're, you're right. And those are some great guiding principles that, I try to live by as much as I can my own principles. I think the principles you, I know the principles that you laid out are so uh, critical and so important, especially for people that are kind of in that 40s uh, age range, Gen Xers, um, early 50s, or you know what, actually anyone, any generation, those principles are very key. And I call out obviously for this show because a lot of times people like us are in our age range and generation. We're going through those periods of transition and many, many people have difficulties really handling the dynamics that come along with these external choices that are made either by us or externally by not by us. And those four principles you listed out are packaged so well and they are a testament to your success. Number one, like you said, you mentioned, you want to just make sure you do something creative and strategic combined that that really fuels you. And then number two, I think you mentioned if you can do the job in your sleep that is not really worth doing, you want to always learn, keep growing, keep learning, keep adding tools, developing and refining your skills. Number three, you mentioned financial literacy. You understood the lessons you've learned from growing up where maybe you weren't around a lot of financial I didn't literacy. learn. <laughs> <laughs> you were there. You, you were broke. <laughs> you, exactly. Exactly. Right. And, and I, I've been there, but you wanted to, to, to learn from that and grow from that and pass it on to your, to your daughter. So financial literacy. And then last, but definitely not least is it, look, I'm just going to be Melissa. That's what you see. You're going to be you, that's who you are. That is your brand. You are who you are. But but you do the work. Obviously, you do the work. Yeah. But no, the work has to the work has to be best first and foremost. Exactly. You, know, you can't half step around that. But you have to be yeah. yourself. And I mean, that is so great. And I know that you, you when it comes to work, you're very into purpose driven work because a lot of what you said is about doing work that has meaning. And if my understanding, you you sit on a board for I think a uh, organization called Forty Eight and Forty Eight. Here in Atlanta, yeah, yeah. which I actually yep, um, as well as the, the Children's Museum and the Beltline, wow. like just all doing really great stuff. And forty and forty eight, I mean, seriously, in terms of building all these websites for a bunch of different nonprofits and really having a major impact using people's talents is mm. just phenomenal. That is so phenomenal. I, and I had the pleasure of interviewing Jeff Hillemeyer on this show as well. Uh, oh man, he yes. rocks. <laughs> yeah, he was, I can't remember what episode, but I interviewed him. And uh, for those of you listening, check out that episode with Jeff Hillemeyer. All yes, about, all about purpose. The truth. All about purpose. Yeah, we talked a lot about purpose driven work. He's doing great things with Dragon Army 4848 and mm-hmm. even the new nonprofit, uh, Ripples of Hope. So, speaking of hope, I hope everyone really listens to these lessons learned and, and these nuggets. And on a personal level, there's one final question because I can talk to you for hours, but there's one final question before we wrap this up <laughs> that I always ask Melissa, my guest, because this is when we're going to get really into this personality of Melissa. Oh, All right, Lord. here we go. Here oh, we go. No. Here we go. Don't, don't be scared. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. Are you ready? So, I'm Melissa, ready. Ready. Melissa, if there was a song that would play every time you enter a room or when you walk down the street that perfectly fits you, your story, and the brand of Melissa McGee Proctor, what song would that be? What would be your own personal theme song? Okay, now look. So, I, <laughs> do I have to pick one? Okay. Just like, no, you, I, got, I got a lot. Like, I, I got a lot. I got a lot of good <laughs> ones, too. They all have different meanings because, you know, I'm just a multifaceted. Oh, uh, you know what? hard to pick this one. You know what? Okay, <laughs> since, since, since your family, when you used to kick it over there at Techwood at Turner, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a pass. I'll give you, you can, you can name a couple. You can name a few. <laughs> Okay, 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 cool. Um, so I'm a huge Soka. My family's West Indian. I love Soka and Carnival. And so I have a theme song that all my friends know is my theme song. It's Wine and Queen. 
What is and it? Whining Queen? This is, it's, it's Whining Queen. Oh, That's wow. it. And it's all about, you know, dancing from the time we were a kid. Marshall Montano is one of my favorite soca artists. He has another song called oh, Vibes Can Done. It's all around just like, just being it, mm. uh, which is great. I'm also from Miami. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of times when, when I, I think of music, <laughs> professionally, it may not be very representative, but I love the city girl. And I'm just going to leave that right there. And so there may be a City Girl song or two that I would select <laughs> in certain contexts of being my first being song. And, you know, I mean, because you can I'm every woman it up all day, but I'm not that traditional. So that's, that, that's all right. But, all right. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I definitely would pick, you know, why they cry. Are you laughing at my City Girl? And no, I love I it. I feel like you're laughing at <laughs> I feel like I, this is judgment. You're no, judging me right hey, now. No, hey, no judgment. <laughs> I actually love this question because I love getting inside. The, I love it. <laughs> all right, oh, going. man. Yeah, I'm sure you would learn a ton. Keep, you, you would learn a ton. See the girl, hey, no, it's, it, is, it is all good. Keep going. Keep going. Is there another one? I love yeah, it. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the the other one would be um only because I like it that much and I'm a huge Stevie Wonder fan. Do I do is my favorite song oh. ever made oh yes uh in, in in certain contexts so if that song was just playing i don't even need lyrics just like the music behind it i would it would just be amazing <laughs> so yeah. yeah 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 well everyone loves stevie and that song i'm a big i i can't even say enough about stevie i mean that that got some honeysuckle chocolate dripping kisses for yes! me yes <laughs> all of that you, you, you understand you understand so yeah yeah it's all about energy for me it's all about energy <laughs> Uh, Soka. <laughs> hey, yes. this is this is like one of the best answers because I get a a full portfolio and a recipe yeah, of that. A whole new genre to roll with. A, a whole know, genre. You know, this I'm, is uh, great. Going to carnival uh, yes. next month. Oh, congratulations! Celebrating Trinidad, and so I'm. What are you I'm celebrating? Just, what are, you, are you just celebrating? Just my, I'm turning forty. And it's my fortieth birth year. Wow! And I'm celebrating all year long. So I, could, I turned forty in May, so. Kicking it off in Trinidad and partying straight through. You got to live life and celebrate life every day. Yes, you do. So, well, we, well, I celebrate you. I celebrate the opportunity, Melissa, to have this conversation with you. It's been, it's been oh, fun. You. It's been fun. It's been, uh, it's been fruitful. It's been educational. It's been, it's, it's been a lesson. And again, you, your story as a leader that's hitting this milestone year, which congratulations. Um, there's so many nuggets. There's so many, there's so many nuggets in your story. And I mentioned so many of them and I, and it's interesting. You, you ended off talking about, you still don't know what you want to do when you grow up. And I heard that as a through line, like even with the internship, you know, you didn't know what you want to do. Well, your mom said, well, do what you want to do for, for the rest of your life. When you left college, well, I don't know what I want to do, but all through that, mm-hmm. you still stay consistent with just being you. You are creative. You just you were just you. You found ways to channel your creative energy and, and things that you have, the gems and the, the skills and the passions. And everything just happened to work out for you. And so, you know, years from now, like, am I going to see you become an owner of an NBA team? I don't know. Am I going to see anything's you? Possible. Anything's possible. That's what I'm saying. Like, I have, I honestly, you know, you may continue to lead the Hawks in their marketing for many years. I don't know. But what I do know, what I do know, Melissa, is that you will be successful and you will continue to champion the cause of being you, being great, being disciplined, being determined, being creative, being strategic. And just being you. And I thank you. Please tell everyone, Melissa, um, how they can keep in contact with you and witness you along your journey. Well, no, I really appreciate it. I am uh, currently writing a blog, actually working on a book. Um, oh, so yeah. on Medium right now, there's some excerpts of it. Okay, what's the name? Um, what's from Ball name? Girl to CMO uh, is the name of, of the book that I'm, I'm working on at the moment. Okay. okay. Uh, and how to pivot when you still don't know what you want to be when you grow up, <laughs> which is so much of what this conversation is. Right. Um, but yeah, if anyone wants to stay in touch, I'm huge on LinkedIn. So if you just mention this podcast and on LinkedIn, uh, Melissa McGee Proctor, I will absolutely represent and reach back out, I promise, because I'm diligent uh, with my LinkedIn-ness. And I just thank you for this platform and for all the work that you're doing representing for the Gen X crew. Well, thank you so much. That means a lot. And I cannot wait to read your book. Keep working on it. Keep working on that book, Melissa. Keep writing. Keep doing you. Mm-hmm. Keep being a gem. And uh, thank you for spending time with me and our Gen X Amplified audience. Awesome. Have a great one. Take care. Take care. Bye. 
Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> that was my girl, Melissa McGee Proctor from Ball Girl <laughs> to CMO. All right then. <laughs> All righty then. Anyway, uh, great conversation, great conversation. And so that is so awesome what she is doing with the Hawks with the State Farm Arena, with business, with all these life lessons. And I hope, no, I don't hope, I know, I know you got a lot from that conversation. But uh, so great to see what she's doing and the path she is blazing. Melissa McGee Proctor, CMO of the Atlanta Hawks. Make sure, as she mentioned in the episode, make sure you reach out to her on LinkedIn. Catch up with her. She is doing tremendous things and just a phenomenal leader and inspiration for not just us people that are in 40 plus <laughs> Gen Xers, uh, but for everyone, all generation, all ages, kudos to her. Hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget to go over to Gen X Amplified for the show notes and make sure, make sure if you have continued to receive value from not only this episode, but all of the episodes, please, please, please give us a great rating and review on iTunes. I truly will appreciate it. And also, I actually almost failed to mention, uh, we did mention him in the episode, Jeff Hillemeyer, uh, a, a colleague, a, a mutual colleague of ours, of Melissa and, I, and mine. Uh, Jeff Hillemeyer, I interviewed him on Gen X Amplified. Great leader. Make sure you check out episode number 39, where he and I chat about his experiences and leadership lessons and all about having a purpose-driven life. He is the CEO of Dragon Army, co-founder of 48 and 48, and the founder of Ripples of Hope. But as always, as always, thank you so much for listening to Gen X Amplified. And don't forget, it is more than a podcast. It is a movement. Take care.